Okay, um, th this afternoon I want to um, build a little bit on what I shared last night. And some of us, I think most of us were not here last night. And last night what we spoke about was the greatest truth. And if you were here last night, you have an idea what that was about. What, what, what I tried to, to focus on was, was the fact that there are many different ideas as to what is really important. In the arena of religion, everybody focuses on something that he thinks is important. And everybody thinks that his particular, his peculiar doctrine is the most important thing. But last night, we looked at the fact that the Bible emphasizes that the greatest truth of all is the correct knowledge of God. To know God as he is, is the greatest issue in the universe. Amen. Because before... Man needed to be saved beyond the salvation of man is the question, what is God like? And that question became critical because there was a, an angel, Lucifer, who, ha, who has become Satan, who raised up rebellion against God in heaven by besmearing the character of God. Lucifer convinced many angels that God was not a trustworthy person. He, he painted a picture of God that has haunted the world for 6,000 years. And that bad picture still exists within Christendom. And there are many ideas that float around, even in Christian groups, that contribute to this faulty understanding of God. The greatest message in the universe is the message of the truth about God. And until we get this right, our ideas our religious ideas will always be wrong. We'll have bits and pieces. Okay? But we'll never get the true picture and our message will never be truly in harmony with heaven's emphasis till we get this right. The greatest need of the world is to correctly understand God. One of the reasons why there are so many atheists, one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons why there is so much opposition to Christianity is the fact that the Christian God, the, the, the God that is painted in Christianity, is, is, is a confusing person. Many times we, we try to disguise the inconsistencies by saying, we are not supposed to understand God. God is bigger than us and we can't understand God. <laughs> Since I was a child, you know, my instinct is this. The people that I don't understand, you know how I treat them? I stay far from them. And if I try to understand them and I find that there are barriers that I can't get through, I do what I need to do, but I keep my distance. That's how I treat people I don't understand. I'm aware that this is a barrier to, 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 to close friendship, and that's why I try to break down my own... I, 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 if I'm not careful, I tend to be a person who I put up barriers. Maybe I'm trying to protect myself, but I put up guards. I'm not like Howard by nature, okay? He wears his heart on his sleeve, okay? I tend to be a little bit more withdrawn, but I'm trying, to, I'm trying not to be like this because I know that when you create barriers, it makes it difficult for people to understand and get close to you. So... But you do it when you, when you are trying to protect yourself, right? But, but, but we, do the, we do that to God. Christianity does that to God. They come upon these mysterious ideas, inconsistent ideas, and they say, it's God. You are not supposed to understand. You are just supposed to accept the strangest ideas, okay? And I have not been satisfied with these kinds of answers, and, and that is one reason why I believe God has helped me, helped us to understand, to get some insight into God and his character that may be a little different, because I'm not satisfied with these. God says, God says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And then you tell me it's a mystery. <laughs> then you tell me I'm not supposed to understand. 
I mean, you are confusing me. Jesus says, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17 and verse 3. God wants to be known. Okay, God wants us to know him. In fact, the whole Bible, from beginning to end, the whole purpose, the great purpose of the Bible is to reveal God. Amen. When you come to Revelation chapter 14, where it talks about the final message to be given to the world. It says an angel flies through the midst of heaven having the everlasting good news, the everlasting gospel to preach to every, every person on earth. And he says, fear God and give glory to him. That's how the message begins. How do you fear God and give glory to him if you don't even understand him or his ways? And I'm carrying on a little bit because what I want to say is that when you, when, you, when you are able to break through the confusing ideas, you understand, you come to understand that the whole purpose of the Bible and Christianity and all religious experience is to bring us to a place where we understand and know God so well that all we want to do is to be with him. That's it. Heaven is going to be an amazing place. You think because you get to walk on golden streets, that doesn't turn me on that much. I don't like the feel of gold. It's just metal, cold, hard. To walk on golden streets doesn't turn me on so much. I guess, you know, I've been to Niagara Falls. I've been to the Grand Canyon. That's part of the privilege of getting, getting to go to, to, to preach in different places. People always want to carry you somewhere. So I've been to a few places, and I saw the places, and I left with an image in my mind, and I thought, okay, so I saw it. So what? I mean, if I could have taken my grandson with me, and it, it would have meant something. But now I see. So what? And I guess when I get to heaven and I see the tree of life and the, the policies and whatever else, after a while, my senses will be satiated. And I will be filled up and then I'll say, what next? Okay, if that is the appeal of heaven, it's going to pass after a while. But you know what has endured? What has endured and what? I have been with my wife for 40, 40 years. And I'm still turned on. Okay, 40 years, and I still, I still call her on the phone every day, morning and evening, and I'm still happy to hear her voice. And I'm still looking forward to going home and seeing her there. I was just talking to Brother George, and I said, you know, he, his family had this terrible experience where he lost a daughter. I lost my brother two years ago, and I was saying, now that I understand death, I'm afraid of it because I, I, I suddenly understand what it means to lose a part of you. And we know there's going to be a resurrection, but it's hard to live without this person. And I was thinking, I've, I've thought about my wife, and I'm afraid to die because I don't want to put her through that. And I'm afraid for her to die because I wonder how I will go back and sleep in the same bed. I don't, I, I, I think of it and I feel it finally and I don't want to face it. And as I was saying to George, now I hate sin. Now I understand why the last enemy is death. Anyway, I'm saying this to say, I realize that the things that really are important are relationships. Okay? It doesn't matter the house you live in or the car you drive or the kind of road you walk on. And when you get to heaven, it's not going to be different. If you are not comfortable with the king of heaven, mm -hmm. how are you going to enjoy it? The joy of heaven, the real joy of eternity will be fellowship with God forever. Amen. If you don't enjoy his, his company here, you are not going to enjoy eternity. It's going to be an eternity of torment and dissatisfaction and discomfort. And that is why the primary purpose of life and the primary purpose of religion is to know him as he is and to begin to enjoy him here and now. And that is why I'm saying the false ideas, the mask that Satan dragged over the face of God, that he has perpetuated. You know, I have looked at religions, and I'm glad I'm a Christian, because the only Christian, the only religion that presents a beautiful face of the Creator is Christianity. Islam, the God of Islam is a God of 
I mean, they say, Muslims insist, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not tearing down anybody, but I'm trying to tell the truth. Muslims say their religion is a religion of love. Okay, but their God, their God teaches genocide, terror, uh, bombing people, killing infidels, and so on. And, you know, one of the things I discovered about Islam is that the God of Islam does not have a son. I've heard Muslims say that Christians blaspheme because they dare to call God Father. Who are you to call God Father? You know who you are? You know the kind of, we are filthy creatures and he is God Almighty and you dare to call him Father. For them, the creator is too distant and too holy and too great to mingle with things like us. We are, we are chattels, we are little bits, we are little bits of, of, of property in a cosmic game that he manipulates and plays with. The only religion in the world that presents a God with a face of love is Christianity. And I still say that the Christian God has been marred by false ideas. You know, I, read a, I heard a song many years ago, and it didn't mean much to me then, but I'm thinking of the words now. It says that, through Jesus, we came to discover, listen to this phrase, we came to discover that God the Father has a human heart. Man, that doesn't, doesn't sound right. Because you say, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But I'll tell you why it means something to me. Because how can I relate to almightiness? How can I relate to the God of the greatness and the almightiness and the infinity, how can I relate to the God who dwells in a place that I cannot even begin to understand? I have a grandson and he's six years old and I'll tell you something. When he comes around me, I become a child. You know why? Because he cannot become a man. Okay? And I want to be close to my grandson. So I he wants to come and race with his trucks. I'm down there with him, right? He says, Grandpa, let's race around the yard. I'm getting old. My bones are creaking, but I'm running around the yard with him. I'm coming down to his level because he's not, he's not able to come up to my level. What am I going to talk to him about? Theology? Am I going to discuss physics and chemistry with him? I mean, I want to be close to him, and so I'm coming down to his level. The Bible says this is what God did. Amen. The Bible says that no man has seen God at any time. I'm quoting the verses. I'm assuming you know them. I'm not putting them on the screen. I'm, I'm just quoting. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him or he has made him known. God came to us in living color. Amen. As I said last night, he came to us in 3D. In a form where we could get close and feel and touch and empathize and recognize is this what God is like? So the God of the Bible is a God of love. But there are some ideas. And, and somebody said to me that I touched on a touchy point. Was it last night or this morning? Because I started talking about hell. But I'm going to talk about it again because I, I, didn't, I, I wasn't aware that the subject of hell was a touchy subject. But I was just being a little... Free and logical, okay? And, and it's, one of those, it's one of those things. I'm not asking anybody to change your beliefs, but here's what I, I, I'm, I'm going to say. It's one of those touchy areas, but when I think of love, I think of sympathy. I think of tolerance. I think of patience. I think of forgiveness. I think of grace. I think of empathy when I think of love. I know that there is, God will have to put an end to end of sin. Put an end to sin. And I know that when he puts an end to sin, he has to put an end to sinners. I know this. But there is an idea, which I touched on this morning, that God will roast people for a few days, which will extend into weeks, which will extend into months, which will extend into years which will extend into decades, then millennia, then eternity. 
He will be roasting people in a fire that will never end. Where there will be no diminishing and he will roast you forever and ever and ever. But he is a God of love. You are tearing my mind into two pieces. You are using words that I cannot fathom. Don't tell me that this is love in action. Don't tell me. And if you say it's, he's God, so, so he's qualified. All you are telling me to do is stay far from him. If somebody in my circles, if I had a friend, if Howard had that concept of love, I would not trust him. You know, I trust Howard today because he has lost his craziness. But when he was a young, I don't know if I should talk. Before he was a Christian, okay? He was plucking chickens one day. And a dog was there with him. I mean, he looked around, one of the chickens was missing. <laughs> Can I talk? <laughs> and he called the dog. And he just rubbed the dog. And he took the, the chicken thing and just chopped off the dog's neck. <laughs> that was him in the past, Okay. If he was the same kind of person today, I would be cautious around him. That was Howard the sinner before he came to the, the, the Lord. And it's not so horrific as it sounds here because in Jamaica, dogs and chickens are in the same category. <laughs> but I know here in America, dogs and cats are almost family. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, what, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying your awareness of what a person does or how a person operates colors how you relate to that person. Mm -hmm. If you tell me that Brother Paul, I, I, in, in Florida, a story was on the news of a man who caught a raccoon. The raccoon was eating his mangoes. He was a Jamaican man, by the way. <laughs> the raccoon was eating his mangoes. And he caught the raccoon and set him on fire. And America was horrified. You know, America was horrified. It was on the news and you can still go on the internet and find it about this wicked man who lit the raccoon. And the man said, I didn't know it was a problem. He was eating my mangoes. I, paid, I bought this mango tree and he's stealing my mango. So he lit him on fire. Um, you think he's, he's cruel? And you're right, he's cruel. When I was a little boy and I caught a mosquito, you know, they are annoying. I would, if I caught him, I'd pluck off his legs and put him there. I would make him suffer because he makes me suffer. And you think about it and you think, that's a cruel act. You know, that's a cruel child. That's our idea of cruel. And you tell me about somebody who's going to roast people forever. You, have had, you, you ever got a burn? You ever got hot water thrown away on your hand? You ever had, had fire burn you for a moment? And, and, and you say he's going to roast people forever. And after a million years, and you say, please, isn't it enough? And he says, no, forever. Ideas, there are ideas in existence in, 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 existence in Christendom which continue to put a mask on the face of God. Now, as I, I know that there are verses in the Bible, as I said this morning, that could lead you to that conclusion. But as I try to point out this morning, many of the passages in the Bible that speak about this and other things, our approach to them is wrong. Because the Bible is full of symbolism and figurative passages, and it's full of statements that, that have a hidden meaning. And I gave examples, like when, when Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. You're going to tell me that Take that literally, okay? And there are many, many, many passages like this. What is important? I, I discovered a, a tool for interpreting the Bible, the, the most important tool, and I'm going to put it to you. Here is tool, the most important tool. Theologians like to talk about exegesis and hermeneutics and da-da-da. Here is the most important tool. Every, yes, the Holy Spirit. Okay, fine. That's a given. But here's, here is a, a, an approach. Every single thing that you ever find that is said about God, run it through the lens of Jesus Christ. Run it through the lens of the truth that God is a God of love. If you find anything in the Bible that seems to contradict this, you don't understand it properly. 
When the Bible says, God says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Do you believe that? Please say no. I believe the, informa- the, 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 the wording is expressing something that is true, but the wording doesn't mean what we think it means. And, and it, I guess I have to explain what I think it means. <laughs> in, in the Old Testament, the Bible is in the habit of expressing what you see as though it is God who does it. Because God, God, God is in control. So when Pharaoh hardened his heart, what does the Bible say? God says, I have hardened Pharaoh's heart. What he means is, I have permitted him to fight against me. I didn't stop him. I could have stopped him cold in his tracks, but I didn't do it. So the Bible says, God hardened his heart because God allowed it to happen. You are translating what you are reading because you know God is not a mindless machine. God is not a person who condemns somebody for doing what he forces the person to do. Same thing, God says, when you look at how God treated Jacob and when you look at how he, he, he treated Esau, you conclude, God didn't love Esau, but God loved Jacob. And that's not the truth. But Jacob allowed God to work in his life while, while Esau from the beginning was a profane person. Didn't allow God room in his life. So God's actions towards both these brothers suggested that God did not love one and God loved the other. And God is... God is using the language to suit what the evidence seems to support. Anyway, I hope that's not too complicated to follow. But anyway, I'm saying it's important that we understand when we read the Bible. And I'm suggesting to you that the greatest tool that you have, anytime you come to the Bible, anything you see that tells you, that suggests to you that God is not operating, is not a God of love you can guarantee you don't understand that passage properly. Search more carefully to find the correct understanding. Because this is the greatest lesson in Jesus Christ. He didn't just come here to die and to provide a propitiation. He came here to reveal God. That's one of the greatest purposes of Jesus Christ. And when you look at the face of Jesus Christ, it's the greatest example of love that the universe has ever seen. So, We need to take that lesson into the Bible and begin to interpret it. Now, I want to use the the phrase I just used a while ago as a kind of basis for, let me see if I can find that verse, a kind of basis for, for continuing with this discussion. I'm going to look for the word propitiation. I have it somewhere, but I don't remember exactly where. I think it's Romans, I think it's Romans... 5 and verse 8. Let me see if I'm right. It's not the verse. It's not the verse that uses the word propitiation. But I want that verse especially because I'd like you to consider what is the meaning of this word propitiation. Romans 3. Thank you. Romans 3 verse what? 25, thank you. I'm going to read it. I would like us to read it because I want us to think about what it says. Yes, right. Verse 25. Whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Can anybody, anybody want to, 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 to give me a definition of this word propitiation? I'll give you a moment. I know, I, I, I know it's a little, it's not, the, it's not the most comfortable thing to speak out in public. So if you don't want to, I understand. But the word propitiation, it, 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 it replacement. replacement. It's, 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 it's a good definition, but it goes deeper than simply a replacement. The word propitiation carries the idea of appeasing somebody. We understand what appease means? It means that somebody's upset, somebody's mad, somebody is angry, and you appease the person. You give him something to kind of calm him down. In, in, in heathen religions, in, in some of these, these pagan religions, what they do, they take a food offering and they put it in front of their God. 
and the God is supposed to be appeased by this food offering so he doesn't cause bad things to happen to them. Now, in the Bible, this idea exists in the Old Testament. For example, after the flood, Noah came out of the ark and he offered an, a, a sacrifice to God. And what does the Bible say happened to God? It says the Lord smelled a sweet smell. Okay, God smelled the smell of burning flesh. And the Lord smelled a sweet smell. And the Lord's heart was, I don't, I don't think it says his heart was changed, but the Lord, the Lord says, I will never again destroy the earth by a flood. The sweet smell of burning flesh. Now, unfortunately, Old Testament ideas have been carried over into the New Testament and people hang on to the Old Testament concepts because the same words are used. I'll give you another example. This one, I think, is in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, I believe. I'll see if we can find it here. Here's, here's another place where it says propitiation. 1 John chapter 2. All right, let's read this one about propitiation, and then we go back to that verse, which I think it, it may be in chapter 1. It says in verse 2, 1 John 2 and verse 2, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's go to chapter 1 and see if I can find that verse I'm looking for, where it says, I'm looking for the verse that says the blood of, yes, it's verse 7. Look at what it says. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, do you believe that blood can cleanse sin? Okay. Blood is made up of plasma and corpuscles. Plasma and corpuscles. Do you believe that blood can cleanse your sin? His blood. What is his blood made up of? All right. I appreciate the answer. What I'm trying to do is to get us down to the very basic meaning of what we are reading. Because, you know, there, there, there is a brother who, who claimed that he found the Ark of the Covenant. And he claims that it is, on, it, it is in a cave under the place where Jesus was crucified. Now, I don't believe the story, but I'm going to tell you what he said. He said that there is some blood on top of the ark, on top of the, the, the mercy seat. And he says, apparently when Jesus was crucified, the blood came down through a crack in the rocks and fell on the mercy seat. According to him, he took the blood and he carried it to be tested in some lab. And they discover that this blood has only 23 chromosomes. Right? Normally we have 46, am I right? He says he found it, it has only 23 chromosomes. What he's trying to say is that the very physical makeup of the blood of Jesus is different from yours and mine. He's saying that the physical structure of Jesus was that he was not human. Which not only denies what the Bible says, but it also focuses your attention on the wrong place. Was it the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, the physical body and the physical blood that took away your sin? The Bible says so, because the Bible is borrowing language from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, what was it that, 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 that atoned for your sin? It was the blood of an animal, right? The blood of a lamb, the blood of a cow, the blood of a sheep, okay? So the, the New Testament borrows the same language. But now, what we have to do is take the illustration and we translate it into reality. What is it that takes your sin? What did the blood represent? Life. Life. It says that in, where, where is it? Leviticus? It's somewhere in Leviticus. <laughs> It says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. God is using blood, but he's not expecting you to think of corpuscles and plasma. 
this, this is taking you into the realm of superstition. If you think that a, a drop of red liquid, it, it's, 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 it's kind of like how pagan religions and some, even some Christian religions operate, right? You know, you know the, 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 the fantasy. It, there, there is a, a, a ghost, and you hold up the Bible or you hold up the cross. And somehow the symbol is supposed to scare the ghost, right? Because they think that in the symbol itself is some kind of power. But you know that Christianity is about spiritual realities, not about physical things. Yes. Okay? Amen. Sin is not a, something that resides in, 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 this, in this thing. It resides in the spirit, in the mind, in the spirit, right? The salvation that was wrought by Jesus Christ was wrought in the realm of the spirit. It's not the fact that blood came out of his side or that they beat him till the blood ran down his face. This is not the key element in salvation. The element in salvation is that the, the life of the Son of God yes. was poured out. He had to die for you to be saved. And that life of Christ comes to us as the Holy Spirit is the element that cleanses us Hallelujah. from sin. Not only takes away the guilt, but cleanses us from sin. Hallelujah. The blood is the life, and therefore, in, in the type, it had to be literal blood. Amen. But what is, it, it, we are told that Jesus ministers his blood in heaven. What is he ministering? Does he have a bowl sprinkling blood? So how does he minister his blood? Because it's not the blood that is the issue. It's the life of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, it's, it's his death that is constantly before the face of God. God never forgets what Jesus did. Constantly, it's always an element that stands between me and God so that I'm forever accepted by God on the basis of the life of Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to do is to say to us, brothers and sisters, that we... We consider the difference between figurative representations and what the reality is. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because clinging to the figurative representations causes us to have a distorted view of God. God is not a, a mindless machine. God is not somebody who is less intelligent than human beings. He's infinitely wise. Amen. People think that let me, let me put another idea to you. This idea I really want to explore, but we don't have enough time. But I'm going to touch on it briefly. The idea of forgiveness. All right? Guilt and forgiveness. I'm going to, I'm going to explore this a little bit. And I, I like to ask questions because I, I question myself first before I ask you, what is guilt? What is guilt? And, and how does guilt reveal itself? That we are told that we are guilty. And because we are guilty, Christ had to die to pay a price, a propitiation, an atonement. What does that real mean, really? What is guilt that it requires death in order to be overlooked? Well, I thought about this hard. I tried to understand, and I discovered that guilt has several aspects to it. First of all, Let's say I, I, I stole something from Brother Malan, okay? God forbid, but I stole something from him. Because I stole from him, guilt comes into the picture. How does this guilt affect the people who are involved? In his eyes, I am guilty. What does that mean? It means that I have broken a rule. All right. So, because I broke a rule... The broken rule must somehow be fixed. That's one. Number two, because I broke the rule and I did something I shouldn't, in his mind, there is a barrier against me. He has made up his mind, I'm not going to allow this fellow to come back to my place. And if he happens to pass by, I'm going to watch him like a hawk. That's problem number two. Problem number three is me. Because I know I stole the man things, if I'm walking through town and I see him coming, I turn into a side street. And if I see him, I pretend not to see him. And if I, if I see him, I hold on my face and I don't even say good morning. Guilt has affected me. It has affected him. And in some kind of way, it has affected the law. I've broken the law. Now, do all of these 
come into the picture when we say that we have broken the law of God and we are guilty? Do all of these come into the picture or do any of them come into the picture or do some of them come into the picture? All of them. All right, first of all, I've broken the rule. All right, so I'm guilty. Because I'm guilty, what, is, what, 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 what next? Okay, so I'm to die. Who, is go- who says I need to die? God says so. So because I stole Malan's screwdriver, he sentences me to die. What would you think of that? Huh? I would think he's more than mean. Mean isn't the word I would use. I would use cruel and hard and merciless. I would say something is wrong with this man's law because I probably would hardly even spank my son for something like that. I'd try something else. But to sentence me to die because I stole a screwdriver. Something in that picture needs adjusting. But this is a, this is a common perception that most Christians have. God says, you broke my law. You have to die. And some say you have to be roasted in a fire forever because you stole something. And if a human being was like that, you would condemn him in, in, most loudly and soundly for being a cruel, hard, vindictive, merciless person. So something in that picture is wrong. The second aspect of it, Melan now has hard feelings against me and he doesn't want me to come near his place again. Does this apply to God? Do you think God had hard feelings against us and was thinking, I want this person to stay far from me because he has sinned and he needs to keep his distance. Does God feel like this? Those of us who are parents, when your child does something wrong, what do you try to do? What's the most important thing when your child has done something wrong? Well, I'll tell you, for me, I need a child to understand that it was wrong. But in those moments, those are the times when I want to hold him. Those are the times when I want to try to find a way to help my child and to impart something into him that will help him. Those are not the times I want to be far from my child. I don't want him to feel condemned. In fact, if I find my child in something wrong, I am, I am dying inside. I want to find out how can I help my child. I don't want him far from me. Those are the times when I want to help him most of all. And I got that from God. I got that from God. In fact, there's a story in the Bible about a boy. Okay? And they say it's a story about the prodigal son. But I like to think it was about the prodigal father. Because the boy did everything that was wrong. He said, Father, give me your, my inheritance before you are even dead. Took the father's money and went off and, and spent it in wild living and chasing women and all kinds of things. And in the story, while the boy was gone till he was feeding pigs, where was the father? He was on his veranda with his binoculars. He was looking down the road every day waiting for his son to come back. People miss that idea. They see the boy eating pig food and carrying on they forget the greatest part of the story because when Jesus told the story, you know what he was, he was pointing to? He was talking about the love of the Father. That's the greatest lesson in that story because people didn't think of God in that way. The Father, when the Son came back, okay? The Son is a legalist. All right, he thinks he's accepted because of his behavior. So he comes to the Father. He says, look here, I have a plan. I'm going to go back. And because I've been so bad, I dare not think of my so- myself as a son anymore. I'm going to ask him to take me as a servant. I will work for him. If he will take me. He doesn't understand the father's love. He thinks the father says, you sinned. You're out of my favor. You come and work and I'll pay you a little bit. So he plans and he comes home and he starts. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. The father doesn't allow him to finish. He grabs, he runs to meet him, grabs his son. By the time the little speech is, is half started. He throws the robe around him, puts the ring on his finger, and he says, my son was dead and is alive again. He doesn't even wait for the boy to ask about anything. He puts him back, reinstates him where he belongs, in his house. It's about the prodigal father, and it's the story of how God feels about you. 
God never had any hard feelings against a sinner. From the Garden of Eden until today, every sinner is loved by God. God has no hard feelings against a sinner. The real barrier on the part of the, in the sin equation, you know what it is? It's you being afraid of God. It's me seeing Melan and walking by on the other side of the road. It's me hiding from him because my guilty conscience is beating me and I think that he is against me. Now, how does God present this picture? To a set of people who are coming out of slavery, they are dunce, their, their minds are darkened, and they have no understanding of spiritual things. You know what he did? He set up a system with, with, with sheep and turtle doves and goats and cows and feast days and all kinds of rigmarole. And he says, go through this every year, over and over. And it's supposed to be a teaching tool to teach them lessons about how God feels and how he's going to work out the plan of salvation. They don't understand it, but they go through the movements. When we come to the New Testament, it's the time for us to begin to understand the meaning behind these things. And that's where we have a problem, because the mask is still on our faces, and the, and, and, and the, the false ideas are still there in the background, and they are causing us to come to wrong conclusions. The Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us that through his son, God was able to open a way to break down this barrier and to bring man back into a relationship with him where our behavior does not matter anymore. Let me show you the verses. I know a little of what I'm saying may be going over your head. I hope not. I hope not. Okay? I I'm speaking from the perspective of somebody who has been feeding on these things night and day for a few years. And sometimes when you do that, you tend to, 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 to try to say too much at one time. And maybe I'm guilty of that. But I'm trying to see. I I'm hoping that if you don't grasp what I'm saying or it sounds a little contrary, you will stop me. Stop me and, 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 and make your point. But um, verse 10, Romans 5 and verse 10. Look at what this says. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Let me pause a little bit. Let me, let's just consider that phrase. When do you need reconciliation? When do two parties need reconciliation? When they are split. When there is alienation between two sets of people, right? When people are not talking to each other, they are not fraternizing together, they are not having anything to do with each other, there is a barrier there, they need reconciliation. Now the Bible says that what God did through Jesus Christ was to reconcile two parties. And when you look at this word reconcile, it brings home to us what the problem really was. Okay? People say it was because the law of God was broken. And this is true. But this is a misunderstanding of the problem. This is a misunderstanding of the problem. If, let's go back to my illustration. I'm sorry to be picking on Melan, but it helps when you can put it in our, our experience. I stole something from, from, from him. There's a barrier between us. And it's complicated because I have an issue now, he has an issue now, and I've broken the law, which is a third issue. So it's a complicated situation. But what really needs to happen, if it is possible for the both of us to come back to a place where the distrust is gone, and the, 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 the broken, what is really the problem is not the screwdriver, right? The problem is that the relationship is broken. I can't look in his face anymore. He doesn't trust me anymore. The relationship is broken. That is the real problem. We need to, if, if there needs to be something that repairs that broken relationship so that it doesn't matter anymore. That is the issue. Now, I really wanted to get to this point from the beginning. That one of the problems that people have, with one of the problems, one of the, the things that 
still obscures the face of God is that people still think that God's problem is that you broke the rules. They think that that is God's problem. The problem is that you broke the rules. That is not the primary problem. And it, when Adam and Eve took the fruit, was the problem that God lost the fruit? Because God created everything. He could make back another fruit if that was a problem, right? The problem between Adam and Eve and God was not the, the, the fruit. The problem was that man had broken his trust and his relationship with God. And it has taken God 6,000 years to repair that damage. And it's still not fully repaired. Because even among those who claim to be God's people, there is still reservation and distrust on our part. Adam and Eve thought God was going to destroy them because they took the fruit. That's why they ran to hide. When God said, if you eat, you will die, God meant if you eat, death will enter your experience. They interpreted it to mean, if you eat, I will kill you. I'm going to kill you for stealing my fruit. I've heard some parents say that to their son. Boy, I will kill you. you come and trouble the thing in Jamaica. <laughs> but um, that's not what God meant. But that idea has been perpetuated. So people think that because you broke the law, God is going to kill you, or he's going to destroy you, or he's going to hurt you. And the only way he can forgive you is if his son, is if his son decides to die instead of you to appease God. So it's like this. God says, you break my law, I decide to kill you. But if my son decides to die instead, I will forgive you for the law and from, from the sentence that I put on you. Yeah, I, 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 hope I'm not, I hope I'm not undertaking to say too much. But the point I'm making is that this idea, this, this, this legal perspective, this view of God, where we see everything through the eyes of the legal framework is one of the, the things that has caused our concept of God to be distorted. I'll go back to something I said last night. When you think of the people that you, have, that you relate to day by day, you have two perspectives. If it's somebody who is, is, is a person in a high position, like the mayor, or, or the, the president, or your congressman, I know in America you tend to be very informal, and you are not very much into titles and positions. But I still think even if it came to meeting the president or so, when, you, when you're about to meet this person, what is in your mind is, what is proper protocol? How am I to stand? How should I dress? How am I to address this person? And this becomes a major part of what you are thinking about when you get into this person's presence. You are not relaxed. So you go through the, 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 the routine, you, 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 you stand straight or you sit carefully. Um, I, I saw uh, the Jamaican Prime Minister recently came here to, to, to see Mr. Trump. He and some other Caribbean Prime Ministers. And they took a picture of them. And it was kind of amusing to me. Amusing but tragic. They were all sitting on, on chairs outside the room, sitting looking so uncomfortable, twiddling their thumbs and so on waiting for Mr. Trump to call them into his office. And they took the picture of these five or six prime ministers from the Caribbean, and they looked so uncomfortable sitting there, you know, but sitting there like a little boy is about to be called before the headmaster. And you could see that they were uncomfortable. Because it's the way, we, it's the way relationships are. It's different I probably would be like, would be like that. Or I hope not. But maybe if, if, if I were supposed to see... I mean, I, I, I know most of us, we think we don't want to be people who, who treat people differently because of their positions. But it's a human thing. But it's different when you meet your friend, right? You, you're not thinking, 
when, when, when I, I go to visit Howard's home, okay, I'm completely comfortable. I walk into his house, I go into his bedroom, I go into his kitchen. When I'm at Marcus's, I can open the fridge and go in and take out something or I walk through and I'm comfortable because I feel like I'm accepted. In other words, the relationship is not surrounded by rules and regulations. You have the relationships that are surrounded by rules, and you have relationships that are surrounded by love. How you view God makes a difference in how you relate to God. If God for you is the God of rules, your attitude is going to be one kind of attitude. I always believe that sin, the, the issue in sin was breaking the rules. That is the major thing. But I've come to understand that the issue in sin is not the rules. It's, your, it's how you relate to God is the problem. And I've learned to understand that there is a greater understanding of sin in the Bible than simply how you relate to the rules. Because, you know, my, my grandson, he took a, he took a little longer to, to learn to walk than some kids. He took maybe about 11 months, I think he took. Okay? And that was a little slow because one of my nephews took seven months. So he took 11 months. But I remember the day he walked. I remember I was in the living room. So was his mother. So was his uncle. And I remember him staggering across the room. And we were saying, go kid, go kid, go kid. And he, he fell in the middle. And I jumped up and said, come on, why did you fall? Bad boy. Do you believe me? I'm not that stupid. Right. We said, good kid, go, come on, go again, go again. He stumbled and he fell. Nobody blamed him for falling. Nobody blames a child who is trying if he fails. Do you? You encourage him, right? You, root, you are rooting for him. The fact that he fell didn't mean he wasn't my grandson anymore. Amen. You know, why do we think that when we fail, God is angry and he's displeased and he said, look here, come on, you failed. If you do it again, I, I will smite you. I will release my lightning against you. Where does this idea come from? It comes from the idea because we see him as the God of the rules. You know, like you're in the army. You step in the commanding officer's place and you didn't salute and he sends you to KP, right? or puts you on duty to clean toilets or something. Because you, 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 this is the relationship that you're in, and you must. The rules define how you live and how you behave, and you must stick by the rules. So it's a rules-based relationship. And I'm saying, is this the kind of relationship you have with God, or is God your daddy? So, coming from the Old Covenant... There is this, the, the law was our schoolmaster. God's people were placed under the system of the law, and that is how they knew God. God was the God of the law. Jesus Christ came and he revealed God as the God of love. And he says, in this profound statement, he says, listen. The time has come when those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. You must worship God as God is. Because God is looking for those kinds of people to worship him. The greatest glory you can give to God is to understand what God is really like and to treat him accordingly. That's the greatest glory and the greatest service you can give to God. Amen. Treat him as he really is. And stop treating him like a stranger. And stop treating him like, like, like the policeman. Stop treating him like the, 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 the huge administrator. Yes, he's Lord of the universe, right? But when my father, when, when, when the president is my daddy, I don't know him as a president. I go into his, I go into his bedroom when I, have a, when, when, I, when I have a mind. I cry in his presence if I want. I ask him for what I want because he's my daddy. The stranger doesn't behave that way. The stranger can't behave that way. The, stranger, the stranger's relationship is defined by rules. And the stranger must walk by the rules. But when you are sons and daughters, God is our daddy. 
And that takes away all the stress, all the discomfort, all the hard questions. The God of the universe, the creator of worlds, is a God of love. He's a God of love and he's our father. And that's the greatest message that there is in the Bible. Let me read a verse from Galatians chapter 4. A couple of verses. All of this chapter is a valuable chapter to read, but I'm just going to read a couple of verses. It says in verse 3, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. And he's referring to the time when God's people were placed under the law. They were under the elements of the world. That's not a disrespectful term. The law was all about this world. There was a sheep from this world. There was a goat from this world. There was an altar from this world. There was a sanctuary from this world. They kept feast days from this world. Everything in the law was of this world. God put his people under the elements of the world. That's what governed and controlled their lives. Why? Because they were spiritual children. They were not capable of understanding spiritual things. Sometimes I wonder if we have graduated. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. Jesus came under that system to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God had sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father, Hallelujah. wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and daughters too, I might add. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, I'll tell you this. I know I've mentioned this before, but some things are, are worth repeating over and over. I had six brothers and three sisters. But in the course of my life, as a, as a child growing up, my mother had so many of us that even when they couldn't afford it, they needed to have a helper. There was, there, there was usually, very often, somebody in the home, usually a young lady who, who would help my mother. And you know something? When I think back over the years, I can vaguely remember the name of some of them. I think one was named Petrel. One was named, we call her Babe, Sister Gaina. I remember those names. But they are vague, distant memories. I can't even remember what they look like. You know something? They came. They stayed a year, some of them. I think some might have stayed two years, and then they were gone. But you know who never left? My six brothers and my three sisters and myself. We never left. Why did these helpers come and go? If they didn't perform properly, they had to go. If they were not paid properly, they left. They were in the home on condition of their performance. If they performed well, they could stay. If they didn't, they had to go. I can tell you that me and my six brothers, more than my three sisters, we raised Cain in that house. We turned the place upside down. Nobody ever said I had to go. Even when I was a teenager and I started being rebellious and going out at night when my father wanted me home, he never ever said, you have to go. I belonged. I was family. Family is in the house to stay. The servant is there conditionally. If you perform, you can stay. If you don't perform, you go. Isn't it wonderful that the Bible says, God has delivered us. You are no more a servant. What does that say? You are in the house, not on condition of your performance. You are in the house because you are flesh and blood. The flesh and blood in my veins says, I am Clayton. I can't lose that identity. It doesn't matter if I behave bad or I behave good. I'm Clayton. God has redeemed you to himself by the blood of his son or the life of his son. That life is in me. I am family. And, you know, I, I might keep saying this. 
I know that every time I talk like this, somebody will say, are you saying that you're free to misbehave if you want? Okay, I'm going to say yes. Right. I am free. If you're not free to misbehave, you're not free. I am free to misbehave. Paul says, all things are lawful. The law cannot speak to me. Why? My place in the home has been elevated beyond the reach of the law. My place in the home does not depend upon how I relate to the law. It depends upon how I relate to Christ. Being in the home on the basis of the law is for servants. The servant must conform or leave. The son is not there on that basis. But look, does the son need the law? I don't want to dishonor my father. My father's name was Clayton. Because he's dead now. My mother's name is Clayton and my name is Clayton. Look, I don't want to disgrace my family. I don't need a rule to tell me that I'm to behave in a dignified way, in a decent way. Because it's my family. God's family is my family. I belong to the family. Why would I want to live contrary to God's principles? Do I need rules to make me behave right? If you need... I'll tell you something. The, the person in here who needs a rule to say, don't steal, put up your hand. If you need a rule to tell you not to steal, look here, you better go find Christ. In fact, you don't need Christ. You need, you need, you need a policeman. In fact, I would go further to say, if somebody has to tell you don't kill, you need psychiatric help. Why do we believe Christians need the laws in order to live right? God has taken us above and beyond that. The laws are for criminals. The laws are for lawbreakers. God has made me a son in his kingdom. He has made you his sons and daughters. He has taken us out of the place where our, our, our belonging depends upon performance. We are on a higher level. Hallelujah. So... Our place in the home is secure. Can you lose it? If you want to, if you choose to reject Christ, if you go back to unbelief, you can lose it. But it's not very easy. Because when he has you in his hands, he's not going to let you go. You have to deli deli deliberately choose and say, I don't want you. You have to go back like a dog to his vomit. You have to be the crazy person who say, I have seen paradise. I have tasted, I have drunk from the golden cup, and I prefer the gutter. You have to be that kind of crazy person to lose your salvation because God is not letting you go easily. And if on the journey you stumble and fall sometimes, I can see God and the angels. Yeah, come on, try again. And he gives you his hand and he lifts you up. And he keeps on doing it because you're family. And that's the way family is. So, I know that in what I said this evening, I've been a bit jumbled. I think sometimes I try to say too much at one time and it happens. But I hope that you have been able to appreciate and understand the main point I'm trying to make. You know, let us, let us leave this meeting with a, a greater focus and a determination that we are going to see God as he is, as the God of love, and to allow that image to determine everything that we believe about him. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. We're going to um, dismiss with prayer, so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me.